Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Je suis très content de me lever aujourd'hui pour euh, participer dans ce débat euh, concernant l'investissement étranger et, et en particulier euh, la, 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 la transaction proposée euh, entre Sinuk et Nexon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party understands the need for foreign investment. We know that it's important in terms of the creation of, of economic growth, that it's important in terms of the creation of jobs. And we also know that the studies have shown that, uh, that foreign investment tends to increase innovation in a country. We've seen that in Canada. It's, it's valuable and it's important. We also know, of course, that, that there's a lot of foreign direct investment out of Canada, from Canada. That, that's important to our economy. It creates wealth and it creates jobs here at home because there are the returns from that. There are head offices that are based here that, that are very important employers and create good jobs, in fact, in Canada. So we're not like the uh, position of the NDP over the years, which has long been opposed uh, to free trade, uh, to foreign investment. They've, they've opposed you know, foreign investments over and over and over again. These days, all of a sudden, they're trying to present some sort of a new face, a different picture that maybe, well, we're not going to, be, we're not going to look quite so economically irresponsible. Uh, we're going to sort of make it look as though we're a little more open to these things. So although, you know, although they're, they're trying to bury the past, I don't think Canadians are, are buying it so far. We'll have to wait and see. But Mr. Speaker, uh, the Liberal Party has been asking for weeks for answers from the government in relation to this deal. It's clear the government doesn't know what it's doing in this case, or else maybe it's afraid to tell Canadians what it's doing, what its plans are, how it's going to manage this, or perhaps both. But as a result of this government's economic incompetence, Canadians really have no confidence that they can, they can be assured of being protected by this Conservative government. I mean, let's remember, this is the government that inherited the, lar the best fiscal situation of any new government coming into office with a $13 billion surplus in 2006 when they became government. And they turned that into a deficit uh, before the recession began in 2008. By April and May of 2008, the country was already in deficit again. It yeah. ended that year with a f over $5 billion deficit. So, uh, and, and they hadn't even begun the, the spending on, on, the, on stimulus at that point. So for them to claim that they have had a good record economically, I think most Canadians recognize that's not the case. And so it's hard for Canadians to have the kind of confidence they're looking for that they will deal with a matter like this properly. And there is, I think, for this and other reasons, as well as their failure to talk to, to be open about this, a growing level of cynicism uh, over this deal. And, about, and clearly, it's their actions are a major contributing factor to that cynicism, to the concern the Canadians have about this. Certainly, the report from CSIS, uh, which talks about foreign companies, state-owned companies, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't specify this particular instance, but it talks about the, the issue of, of how this, these kind of deals could create security concerns. That's obviously created a lot of concern for Canadians as well. And so the public has expressed reservations about this deal because the government's failed to be open despite repeated promises. In 2010, the Prime Minister himself said and my honourable colleague a moment ago was talking about some changes they made in 2009 in relation to a little bit of tinkering around security questions. But in 2010, a year after that, the Prime Minister himself said, we need a clearer, more transparent process. And yet we've seen nothing since then. So the government sat on this question, knowing full well that proposals like this would come forward. Probably, you know, I mean, we've been hearing uh, lots of talk uh, in the oil sands and elsewhere, in the, in the West and elsewhere, of, of foreign interest uh, in doing takeovers. And so for the government to say that it wasn't ready, didn't think this was coming, didn't know it was coming, and didn't need to prepare for this, makes no sense. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, I'll be splitting my time with my honorable colleague for Malpec, and I'm delighted to do so. And I look forward to hearing him on this topic in a few minutes. But we even see on the government side growing dissent on the back benches. There even, it's clear, there's clear division on that side. Even, even backbench members on their side are concerned about where the government's headed, or, or maybe, they, maybe they too find it awfully difficult to see where the government's headed on this because they haven't been transparent. And, and also, even in the cabinet, apparently, there's, there's dispute about this. Uh, in fact, the member for Calgary West it, it seems to be the poster boy for opponents to the deal. Uh, but he certainly isn't the only one to question what the government is doing on foreign investment. It's something Canadians have been wondering about for years. 
uh, ever since this fiscally incompetent crowd over there took power back in 2006, because during that period we've witnessed a hollowing out of the natural resources sector in this country. Lots of former leaders in that sector are now gone and owned elsewhere. Think about aluminum, think about steel, think about nickel. Com big companies in these sectors, important Canadian companies, have all been gobbled up by foreign owners. So the government failed, and, and we, sorry, these companies since then have failed to live up to their commitments, and the government hasn't held them to those commitments. The government lacked the fortitude to enforce the commitments that were in those deals. So how can Canadians have any confidence in what the government will do with the next deal, and that it will enforce any conditions it may apply uh, to the Sinook Nexon deal? Of course, it, it probably shouldn't surprise us that the government lacked the fortitude to enforce the basic promises, even the basic promises made in some of those deals, when, um, when we know about the, the government's own record for keeping promises. We know about, you know, that seniors remember, remember of course, the broken promise from this government and this Prime Minister on income trusts. Voters remember the fixed date election law, and that promise was broken. And all Canadians now, these days, are paying more and more because of the broken gas tax promise. The Prime Minister said, Whenever, the, whenever gas, ta gas prices raise above 85 cents, we'll get rid of the tax. We'll, we'll alleviate the, the challenge for Canadians in paying for that. Another broken promise. So we have a Prime Minister who's made a habit of failing to live up to his promises um, or to keep a promise. So how is he likely to ask others to do so? Well, it doesn't seem it's very likely. In fact, part of the problem that we're dealing with today is a direct result of the Prime Minister failing to keep his promise to review and to update the Investment Canada Act, to provide a, a, a clearer process. Now, there are a number of ways of, of doing it. You know, one is by making amendments to the, to the net benefit test, and, and that's one option to look at. Uh, another is to say, well, is there some other process we should use entirely? Do we use one that, that, that still leaves it in the discretion of the government in the end, or do we find something else that, that removes that discretion? That's something we ought to be discussing. And, and one of the reasons we're well, supporting this motion today, Mr. Speaker, is that we believe it's important to have a public discussion about this. It's important to have members of Parliament and Committee discussing these issues. As my good friend from the Scana recently pointed out, the, uh, the six-step test in Section 20 of the Investment Canada Act, um, the test for net benefit, remains a very foggy test. It's not all that clear. And in any given case, net benefits what the Prime Minister decides, despite all the things listed uh, in Section 20. It changes from deal to deal. And as we saw with the potash deal a couple of years ago, we know that decisions are based on political expediency. It was clear the government wanted to go ahead with that deal, but it finally, it finally backed down. Uh, we don't, what we don't have is a clearly defined set of regulations. Is that the way to go? Is it, do we need a different process that takes it out of the hands of the Cabinet? Or do we want to leave some flexibility in government on these decisions? That's the kind of thing that, that a committee of Parliament ought to be studying. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can tell you that I've had a, I had a motion passed last spring after waiting quite a while. A motion was passed, adopted by the Industry Committee to look at this, but we're still not at it. And, you know, that we have a situation around this Parliament where committees go in camera so the government can avoid dealing with things it doesn't want to deal with. And, I mean, this is a case where the Prime Minister said in 2010 he wanted to deal with this. He wanted this study. The Minister of Industry said a year and a half ago that the committee ought to be looking at this. Well, I mean, who has a majority on the committee? You know, has the government really allowed the Industry Committee to study this question if it hasn't happened? They have the majority. They control the agenda there, and yet the committee hasn't studied this, this issue. So we know who's in control of that. And the unfortunate truth is, because of the Prime Minister's failure to keep the promise again, there will be a lot more potential takeovers that will be decided on this very sketchy basis. And that's economic mis mismanagement, to add to their fiscal mismanagement, Mr. Speaker. The sad truth is the government hasn't done its homework on this deal, even though it had plenty of time to prepare for this kind of situation. The same way they failed to do their homework on the Northern Gateway pipeline proposal, as we heard from Former, former Conservative Minister Jim Prentice this very week was talking about how they totally failed to consult Aboriginal communities, how they haven't lived up to their responsibilities. Now, I see, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that it's time for me to come to a close, and I look forward to uh, questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, 
Uh, this